oh my god yeah. you really want to go in flames no way you're the star of the show okay good night everyone Whew. all right we did it uh all right so normally in advance i talk to all the co-hosts and find out what they're going to do um but i just showed up seconds ago to my computer um so what happened was my son is buying a car because he's graduating and so we went and we took the car to the mechanics but the car's only got one day of insurance and the insurance runs out tonight and so we went to the mechanic and the mechanic called me at 20 minutes ago and said okay car's done and so then we had to go and take pick up the car and drop it off at the guy who were potentially buying the car for anyway it was crazy so <laughs> and we're two minutes late. I feel now we're four minutes late, but I feel we're all right. Um, where did you get the Dare Mighty Things shirt, Tanya? Oh, this is from the Wee Martians shop. Oh, cool. Okay. I like that I had to look down to see what shirt I'm wearing when my face is literally up in front of me on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> that's the um, uh, that's the parachute from perseverance yeah. right yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> okay cool all right we're, we're live by the way did i mention that yeah you did not no yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah hello everyone we'll do this live um Radio okay do this show live every week yeah yeah exactly <laughs> what a burden as uh, opposed to as opposed to uh what <laughs> as opposed to in, i don't record in, after the, the ether. fact yeah um cool okay we're all just dumbstruck but you know we're starting this right on time then we'll start right now all right i can put you guys all back in your boxes uh back to me all right we're all streaming i've got the intro here okay here we go Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, May 12th, 2021. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week we're going to be talking about ingenuity, uh, sounds in space, oddball star, shock scientist, strange supernova, recent volcanic activity on Mars, and a uh, bottle of wine aged in space. Come on, really? All right, we'll get there. Uh, joining me this week on my screen, I've got Dr. Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. I want some space wine. Yeah, I want some space wine. I actually have, I have space tomatoes. So there was like a... That's not the same thing. I just want to be clear. No, no, no. no, no. I want space wine. Yeah. So, but I don't know, a bottle of wine that went to space or, well, you know, we're already just ruining Moya's story, so we better just, like, stop it. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I grow tomatoes every year where the seeds went to space at one point and have come back. So it's pretty cool. Um, all right, we've also, speaking of Moya, we've got Dr. Moya McTeer. Moya. Hi, Fraser. I couldn't resist the wine story. I, no, I think it's cool. It's cool. Um, is the doctor getting, is that getting old yet? Do you mind that I'm just going to say that no. every single time? In fact, you know what, for the rest of, all this entire season, well, I'm only I didn't even know. Congratulations! Yeah, I think you gotta do it every time. Yeah, as Doctor McTeer. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's not old. Please do it. Yeah, every. please every, every single time. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> we will. I won't. I'll forget. Uh, we got Collins. Sorry, Carolyn Collins Peterson. Hey, Carolyn. Hey there, and congratulations to Moya too. I think you were defending the last time I was on. So there you go. Thank you. All right. Before we get into this week's cool stories and our special guest, I just want to give a huge thank you and a reminder of the incredible team at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are our friends, they're our family, they're our executive producers. And it's funny, uh, just the other day, I was uh, someone was asking on my YouTube channel about how I had so many awesome guests on the various shows that I do and like how they wish that there was some way that they could have my job. I was so glad to tell them that they can, and all they have to do is go to the Weekly Space Hangout crew, sign up, you get to become an executive producer of all of the shows that we do. Then that you have all the credibility that you will ever need to reach out to any guest you want and have them show up on the show. So go to wshcrew.space and you get to take my job. All right, uh, speaking of special guests, we've got Tanya Harrison. 
Kenya, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so the big question I always ask people, who are you? What do you do? Uh, I am a professional Martian. I've spent the last 13 years working in science and mission ops for different Mars missions, including uh, Perseverance, Opportunity, Curiosity, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, I'm a geologist by training, um, but I've done some things that kind of mix between geology and business development and engineering. It's kind of been all over the place. Uh, and right now I also work for um, a commercial Earth observing company, so nothing to do with Mars, called Planet, which has a couple hundred satellites that orbit the Earth every single day to image the Earth and look for change. That's super cool. So then I guess which, which missions, which roles did you play? Uh, you, see, you ran through literally everything that's ever gone to Mars. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to need to tie it you is, down to something specific here. So that part is actually really cool. I was thinking about that the other day. Like Sojourner is the mission that got me into Mars. And I've worked on essentially every rover since then in some capacity, which blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, but I did them kind of in reverse order. So I started on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. I was in the, uh, the targeting team for the context camera and the Mars color imager on board that. And then I moved to Curiosity. I was what's called a payload downlink lead for the MMM cameras. So Mass Cam Molly Marty, which is basically look at the images when they come back and see if they tell you anything important about Mars. Uh, same role for um, Opportunity, but for the panchromatic cameras. So just the, the color eyes of the rover. And same thing again for, well, I guess not quite for Perseverance because I, I left working on the mission before it landed. So I mostly worked on um, landing site selection stuff. So I was one of the people advocating that we go to Jezero Crater and we did. So, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really has been a phenomenal place. And, we're you know, it's just getting started. I think like today, Perseverance finally rolled out starting to use its armor just in the last couple of days. Ingenuity has been flying. We're getting great pictures. It's going to be amazing to see the science coming out of out of Jezero. Um, so then what I guess was one of the coolest things that were discovered by the instruments on your watch? Ooh. If you have all um, these eyes, you know, all these robotic <laughs> eyes and 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 such on all these different rovers and spacecraft. I'm kind of biased. I, I really love the satellites more than the rovers. Uh, just I think it's where I started. And so my heart is there. And the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter caught a lot of things on Mars that were changing or dynamic that we didn't actually know were there or we maybe suspected were there from older missions like Mars Global Surveyor in the 90s and early 2000s. We hadn't seen it. And so catching things with MRO like avalanches coming off the edges of the northern polar cap, like catching them as they were coming off the cap. So we saw these dust plumes coming up. Um, new gully flows, new impact craters, impact craters that exposed ice from below the surface. Like we never expected to find that. And that was a complete accident. We just have, we find little craters all the time. And then one day we found one that had bright material, like white material in the middle of it, instead of just being a black spot. And we're like, oh, that's weird. And that's what most of science is, is just looking at these pictures from Mars and saying, that thing looks weird. Let's yeah. take a bunch of different pictures, different angles. Let's like get some stereo coverage, figure out what the heck this thing is. <laughs> I mean, it, it's amazing. Like with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the resolution of that camera is so fine that it has mapped parts of Mars better in some cases than parts of Earth have been mapped. It's kind of incredible how good a job and how fine detailed a job it is. What kind of a, a role do you think that level of precision provides for sort of the future of exploration of Mars? It helps to answer so many questions about, you know, how safe a terrain is, um, how it might be changing over time, kind of pick the areas that are the most interesting. And the nice thing is you have this like concert of cameras that are working together on MRO. You've got Marcy, which is this global imaging camera that tells you about the weather patterns. So we use that when we select landing sites for the rovers and the landers to make sure they don't go somewhere that happens to get struck by massive dust storms year after year, because that would be a really bad idea. Um, and then we have the context camera, which takes these images that are about usually six kilometers by 130 or so kilometers, which is the context for this high rise imager that takes the 25 to you know 30 centimeter images. Because it's really hard to know what's going on from a tiny like postage size snapshot at high resolution. You need those other context views to see what's going on. 
And so having all those work together paints this really great picture of, you know, every single site that we image on Mars. Uh, the, I mean, the, the story of Mars is really about, you know, in many cases trying to figure out what just the best example of another planet in the solar system that is similar to Earth. We're able to see a lot of the same kinds of weathering, atmospheric conditions, various situation that we have like here on Earth. But at the same time, it's a much smaller world, less massive, cooled down, things are, are very different. What things about Mars would feel very similar if we were to actually like walk around on the landscape? And then what things would feel sort of starkly different? It might depend on what you're familiar with on Earth. A lot of things on Mars are very similar. You know, the volcanoes are pretty recognizable as volcanoes. They look like the volcanoes we have in places like Hawaii. Um, the impact craters, we don't have many of those on Earth, but if you've ever been to, say, Meteor Crater, you would recognize them looking at them all over Mars. Um, there's ancient outflow channels that used to have water in them but don't have them today, but you might be able to recognize those as a place where there used to be a river or some places where we see shorelines inside craters, so you can tell that there used to be a lake in there. But in terms of being different, I think just looking at any of the photos from the landing sites where we have the rovers and the landers, just boulders everywhere for the most part. Um, and there are probably places on Earth that used to look like that before humans were around. But we have done a really good job at sort of sanitizing everything. So we've pushed things out of the way to make buildings and roads and agriculture and stuff like that. So I think seeing an entirely untouched landscape by you know any kind of life whatsoever, not just humans, but biology in general, I think is something that will feel very foreign to us when we get there. Uh, as humans. Yeah, I mean, we're both Canadian. And so and you know, they simulate chunks of, uh, of Mars at like Devon Crater, you know, in northern Canada. So you know, I guess it really depends on what country you're from, how, how familiar or different <laughs> the place is going to look. Um, so let's talk about Planet Labs. Um, what is your work with with Planet Labs? So I'm the director of science strategy, which is a combination of working with the research community using our data to try to figure out how you can apply this near daily high resolution imagery to address usually things that are related to climate change, um, but also some human related things to like um, monitoring human rights abuses and things like that. Uh, and then sort of an inward facing role as well. So kind of helping to educate folks inside the company who may not come from a space or remote sensing background, just about what all the capabilities of the data are based on the really cool things that the science community are doing. And it's, it's such a huge change from Mars because right. like literally you, you can have people that are like looking at walruses in Alaska and marine pollution in the Caribbean and landslides in the Himalayas. So like every day it's, it's something totally different. You never know what you're going to see. Well, give, give us an idea of that. Like, uh, like if, like how often are parts of the planet being imaged by, by the planet lab satellites? I mean, we've been tracking them on universe today, all the various launches that, that have gone up and the, and we use the images from time to time when there's some really interesting story. Um, what is the, sort of like how often are parts of the earth being updated with the satellites? We image the entire landmass of the earth almost every day. So wow. it depends every once in a while, like if there's clouds or something in the way, but yeah, we're getting almost the entire planet every day at three meter resolution, which means anything that's about nine meters in any dimension we can resolve. Wow. And, and what, yeah. but you can do a higher resolution on purpose, right? Like if you're like actually aiming at some specific target. As opposed right. to just like so I guess a wide we have field. Two, yeah. Yeah, we've got two separate constellations. So one are the Dove satellites, which are probably what we're most well known for. And they're about the size of a loaf of bread or like a corgi is the, the, com the description I like to use because people can kind of visualize like holding a corgi in their arms. Um, and we have about 180 of those and they are just constantly imaging. They're not targeted or anything. Just anytime they detect that they're overland, they turn on and they just keep going. So they act like a giant line scanner, just building up coverage of the earth as the earth rotates underneath it. So they're, they're kind of rotating around the poles and the earth is under, underneath and it's just choo -choo -choo -choo. But then we have 21 Skysat satellites that image at 50 centimeter resolution. Wow. So not quite as high res as the high rise camera at Mars, which puts that into a little bit of perspective. The images that you look at in something like Google Maps or Google Earth are often not as high of resolution yeah. as the high rise images that you're looking at from Mars. So we're, we're, we're really lucky there when it comes to Mars. 
Um, but the sky scouts, ugh, the sky sats can image any certain place on the planet up to, depending on latitude, as much as 12 times a day. And so with, I mean, with that, as you said, you can see people gathering in large groups. You can see walruses choosing an island to land on. It's kind of it's kind of amazing. One of the you know from the astronomical side, one of the things that I find really interesting is the rise of of surveys. So things like the Gaia survey, things like what Vera Rubin is going to be able to do. Just this idea of gathering all the data and then looking through it after the fact for various things that you're that you're looking for. Do you think that from like an Earth science standpoint, this is going to be more of the future, especially with giant constellations like this? I think so, because you don't always know what questions to ask in advance. So if the data isn't already there for you to look at it, you can't necessarily answer those questions. Or in the future, you might come up with a really great idea, but maybe there wasn't data being collected before you came up with that question. So having that record there is really helpful. And you have a whole fleet, essentially, of Earth observing satellites that kind of work together. You've got NASA's Landsat program, which has been operating for almost 40 years, and it takes you know lower resolution images but they get a bunch of different spectral bands and you have this huge time record uh, the european space agency has their sentinel satellites which collect everything from radar to optical they've got i think there's like six different sentinels that are i think they've all launched now um so like they're all doing different things you've got a bunch of NOAA like weather satellites that are monitoring the earth constantly so we have a huge influx of earth observation data uh, and now you have to figure out the best ways to try to parse through all that. So this is where stuff like you know, big data and machine learning can really come in mm -hmm. handy to try to figure out what are we seeing? Like, what are the patterns? What places are being impacted the most by climate change? And what are areas maybe that we are seeing change that we don't, we didn't expect it or we weren't predicting it, but it's happening. And so then we try to figure out you know, backtrack from there, what's causing that to happen in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there's been, a, like I said, a bunch of stories that, that we've worked on things like being able to track, say, coastal erosion over the course of long periods of time, just you know, every time the satellites are by, just measure the coasts and then measure them again and then measure them again. And then you can actually watch over a decade as the, as the coastlines are, are changing. What do you think the future holds for this, this idea? I mean, the environmental side of it is really exciting because you could you could essentially track in real time what we're doing to the planet precisely and find the worst things that are going on and report people and and hopefully new legislation can come on what do you see the future being for this for for science being able to play a role in this um i think exactly what you said this way you can track people and figure out you know who are the biggest offenders when it comes to these things and then try to crack down on those before it gets really out of hand so it's it's one thing to actually see that these impacts are happening and like do the science on it Okay, that's great. Now we understand it. But if we don't do anything to try to mitigate those damages or stop them, then what's the point? So you actually have to get to the point where you're taking these to decision makers in the government to create policies to try and you know cut down on emissions, um, maybe do some kind of remediation effects in places where you are experiencing maybe a lot of coastal erosion or uh, landslide erosion, um, increased flooding events in places that are being affected by uh, the in increased number of hurricanes, for example. So we can be a lot more proactive now provided we do this responsibly rather than being reactive to all the things that are happening. And you mentioned briefly just this idea of of machine learning that you can I mean, this is the kind of thing that machine learning is super good at. And to be able to just take all these images, feed them into a computer and just tell us, you know, tell us who cut down a tree today. Um, what role do you see that yeah. playing into the future? Or even already? <laughs> the stuff that people are doing with machine learning blows my mind because the uh, the Earth is so much more complicated than Mars in terms of dynamic systems that that's a little bit of a shift for my brain to process. Um, but people are are not only just analyzing like a single data set, but they're feeding in multiple data sets to do things that wouldn't have been possible even maybe five years ago. So we're seeing folks that are combining like satellite imagery with air quality monitoring stations on the ground feeding it into a machine learning algorithm to say, okay, when an image looks like this from space, this is what the pollution level is. Mm -hmm. Well, now we can take that and apply it to places on the planet where there aren't any air quality monitoring stations on the ground and monitor the pollution there from space. Um, or trying to figure out like, when you have areas that are being deforested, you can map those out. You can uh, try to figure out like how much carbon is 
uh, like trapped in those trees. And so when they are cut down, how much carbon is being released back into the atmosphere because of that kind of activity. So seeing the way that people are combining other data sets to get more insights than mm -hmm. you could with a single data set alone, that's the thing that I'm finding really interesting. And so I think the more ways that people think to combine those data sets, we're going to get a lot of really interesting insights moving forward, both from the ground and from space. I got a great question from Arjone. Is the information free or do you have to be a government to get access to the data? So what are the rules for people trying to access the data? For Planet specifically? Mm -hmm, for Planet Labs, yeah. yeah. So for Planet, we are a commercial company. So um, generally you have to pay for the data. We do have an education and research program that offers free access to uh, any like university students, faculty or staff that you can sign up for. Um, we also have some other science programs like we are part of NASA's commercial small sat data acquisition program. So if you are a NASA funded researcher, you can actually just fill out a form and say, you know, here's my grant number and NASA will grant you access to our data through that. So um, we have a lot of ways. There's some other programs too, but basically if you're a student or a scientist, there's some ways to get you data. Uh, if you're not, um, Unfortunately, like you'd have to buy some data, but uh, yeah. there are a lot of public data sets you can look at as well. Like the all of the NASA Landsat data is free and open to the public. Um, the ESA Sentinel data that that's free and open to the public as well. And and all the Mars data, as well. Yeah, all the Mars data. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's the great. I, I always sort of that was the luckiest thing I think in in choosing to be a space science reporter was access to all this amazing imagery from from NASA. Uh, super interesting work. If people want to follow what you're doing, uh, where should they go? Um, if you want to find me, my website is just tanyaharrison.com. Um, or if you want to learn more about planet, it's planet.com. Uh, and I'm mostly active on Twitter. So I'm at Tanya of Mars there. If you have any space or Mars questions or just want to like follow and nerd out about Mars. Yeah. Constantly. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Harrison, thank you so much for uh, joining us here on the Weekly Space Hangout. Really appreciate it. And thanks for uh, all of the outreach that you've been doing over the years. And uh, and good luck in, in saving the planet. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Let's move on to the news portion of the week. Um, uh, Carolyn, you're on my screen. You volunteered. I choose you. What do you got for us? <laughs> yeah, you saw my hands waving. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah. I know that's how it worked. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I kind of got interested in the sounds of space this week. There were a couple of stories that crossed my desk, and one of them had to do with the Perseverance lander, and the other one had to do with the Voyager spacecraft. So I'll do the first one with Perseverance. Um, you know, we've been interested in sounds in space for a while, and we've always had things like when the Voyagers crossed certain boundaries or they heard things at science, we would use the planetary radio astronomy instruments or plasma wave or whatever to, to detect these vibrations that could then be trans, transmuted or, you know, re, recon, um, reconfigured into something we could hear with our ears. Uh, but we hadn't really sent microphones to space, uh, and that was a big argument for perseverance. We need to get, you know, microphones on the spacecraft. So there were several that were that have been launched. A couple of them were that were used on the entry, descent, and landing equipment to to pick up the sound of that. And the SuperCam on Perseverance has a has a microphone that has, for example, it's picked up the sound of the Martian wind, and it's it's there to hear when they're when they're doing laser drilling. So on April 30th, uh, the rover's microphone picked up the sound of Ingenuity's rover, uh, rotors as it was flying across the field of view, wow. which is pretty cool. That's amazing. So just to give you a little background, the rotors move at a top speed of about 2,400 RPM. And uh, I saw a lot of commentary afterwards about it. it was the first time we recorded the sounds of flight on another planet, if you don't think about the entry, descent, and landing. But the flight of another spacecraft being picked up by its parent spacecraft as, as it's flying along. So I listened to it a number of times actually, and it's kind of this dull droning sound, but it's, it's you know, it's sound that we picked up. I thought it was so up. hard to hear. I really <laughs> well, struggled it was. to at hear first anything. I thought it was like, you know, first I'm listening to it going, well, could it be background, you know, stuff from Perseverance? You know, you gotta really know what you're listening for. I was so, and, I was really whining about them putting a microphone on some spacecraft, and now that they did, I'm going to start again. Like, could you put a better microphone? <laughs> that was actually what I was thinking. It's like, what kind of microphone did you put on? Here? Yeah. So, you know, but they did it. I'm glad they did it. And I mean, you know, we have two eyes, we have two ears. We're, you know, we need to be able to explore these things with more than one sense. But there was an awful lot of commentary on land afterwards, 
asking, okay, well, would it sound like that if you were standing on Mars? Well, if you could stand on Mars without having a spacesuit on and you figure out how that's going to be attenuated by the by the atmosphere, I suppose you could say it's pretty similar to what it would sound like. But of course, we're never going to know that because you're always going to be in a spacesuit with Yeah, you, you know, take your helmet on. off. Let's see. Right. That'll work really well. I mean, you can do a, you know, and do a total recall thing. Yeah, but, yeah you, you can test anyway, it Anyway, from... but it's an amazing thing, right? You know, we've got sound from another world. And if we could stand there, it's probably what it would sound like. So that was cool. And then later on, I got to reading like, this little thing crossed my desk about Voyager 1. And Voyager 1 keeps crossing these boundaries. You know, we've always talked about it's out of the solar system. It's this. And it's now out there beyond the heliopause. It's at about 152 AU, I think, as of yesterday. It's about 14 billion miles. And it's out in interstellar space where there's not a lot of density of material. And so the Voyager plasma wave system has been sampling, detecting what, what people are, what they, what they think they're going to hear out there. And I ran across a paper about this hum that it picked up out in interstellar space. So this is a research that was done by a graduate student named Stella Ockert. And it started showing up in the Voyager data starting in about 2017. So after it had left the heliopause. And, and it was about when the spacecraft was not quite at 150, about 135 AU. And it's described as a sort of monotonic hum, a monotonic signal, single tone. And it's persisted throughout this whole data collection period, 2017 to 2020. So they got to looking at it, and after they subtracted all the possible reasons why this noise could be happening, the team has suggested that this, that this is narrow band emission coming from what they call thermally excited plasma oscillations. So basically this thin, tenuous gas out there. And they're tracking this and noticing that there's a, a, a continual rise in density of this material out at that, at that distance. So they're trying to figure out why that is. So it, it isn't really a sound, but it could be transmuted. It could be reconfigured so that we could hear a sound, but it's this very low level hum that's out there in the, in the interstellar medium. That feels like a little bit of public relations workshopping to me that it's a oh it hum. was that's why i went and got the paper yeah that it's a hum <laughs> yeah yeah i don't like yeah. the i don't like it when they take something and then try to convert it into audible sounds like it's either audible sound or it's not like yeah and that's where i was gonna was that. gonna get to is it's really not something that human ears are gonna hear so i guess to get people's attention that you know there is something out there and i think the bigger story really here is that there's it's not just this empty space out there you know it's there's mm -hmm. something out there and now they can use these plasma weight experiments to kind of i don't know characterize the structure of what's out there it might be this tenuous you know plasma that's out there and it's kind of cool but but it's still out there and so what is this telling us about the interstellar medium out to certain distances and they can track that and then the other thing that kind of got my attention was that it really is going to teach us about this density, but we can now start programming other spacecraft that are out there to take a look at the same thing, like New Horizons, like Voyager 2, you know, yeah. that are on the way out there. Yeah, it, you know, are they in interest of space? Are they not? Have they left the solar system? That's the Have they question. not? That is always, yeah. you know, it all just sort of yeah. depends on your perspective on what the, on how big the solar system is. Uh, but still, super cool that we're getting audio and, you know, a microphone. Yeah, it is a bad microphone but at least it is a microphone on mars i'm, I'm i am no, why didn't they send up a yeti you know <laughs> yeah it's like better you know like, you know someone yeah. with like a really nice microphone to do some sound quality all right not a neumann though you don't want to send the neumann up there <laughs> um is that mine oh. um all right uh moya what do you got for us i'll start with the wine oh, yeah. um, just gonna go fun. straight to the wine sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so i saw the story and couldn't resist talking about it Christie's Auction House, which is a British auction house founded in the 1700s, is auctioning off a bottle of wine that spent more than a year on the International Space Station, and it's expected to sell for more than a million dollars, which is just mind-blowing. Take that, um, NFTs. <laughs> right? Um, the bottle itself is from the year 2000. It's a Petrus Merlot from the Bordeaux region of France. I am not a wine drinker, so... Um, I don't know how fancy that is, but the price tag gives me an idea because each bottle, an individual bottle that wasn't sent to space would cost about $6,000. <laughs> right. Um, well, That's so like a, like a bottle of wine weighs about a kilogram and a kilogram to send to space on board the 
like some a Soyuz. You're I'm paying. Pretty, you're paying a markup. Yeah, yeah, no yeah, markup yeah, yeah. In yeah. there. Yeah. This so is you, a market value. Yeah. So I'm guessing you're probably paying, say, twenty, thirty thousand dollars just for for the launch costs to mm. send it to space, and I guess mm. storage costs of it spending. So how much did it go for? Oh, well, it hasn't been auctioned off yet. It's oh, just expected. it's yeah. up for sale right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. or it will be soon. Um, the proceeds from the auction will help fund more wine in space experiments. Uh, so the private company that sent the wine up to the International Space Station is called Space Cargo Unlimited, and they have five more experiments uh, lined up for what happens to wine things in space, like what are the effects of microgravity on grapevine shoots? And uh, they have a plan to study the fermentation process in space and how microgravity and cosmic radiation can affect that process. They did a blind taste test. There were 12 people, a mix of scientists and wine connoisseurs. They tasted the space wine and compared that to an earth wine of the same vintage. And there were clear differences in color, taste, and smell of the wine. And one wine expert said that it tasted about two or three years more mature than it actually was. Uh, I love the idea that she can like taste yeah. the difference in like two years. Mm, That's awesome. I taste the cosmic rays. Yeah. Actually, a few a few years ago, there was a similar study involving whiskey, and they took uh, whiskeys up to uh, the station in little sort of mini replicas of what the barrels would be. And they actually found something very similar, which was that the whiskeys were a lot more intense than their Earth counterparts of the same age. And part of the idea, I think, was that because they were in zero gravity, you don't have the same sort of settling uh that you hmm. have on earth and that the circulation inside of the container was more efficient and so basically more of the alcohol spent more time in contact with the aging parts and that kind of accelerated the process wow That's you just cool. you just snatched a little bit of science out of the uh, jaws of nonsense so i think that's, i love science yeah, like this <laughs> yeah that's that's pretty cool all right now i'm a little on board um uh hit us with your other story story moya Okay, cool. Some some more science stuff. Uh, it's about a weird supernova and a, a weird star that made it. So back in 2019, there is a supernova discovered by the Atlas Telescope in Hawaii. It's called SN 2019YVR, in case you want to look it up. It's a type 1B supernova, which means it was formed by the collapsing core of a massive star at the end of its life cycle on the main sequence. And type 1B supernovae are interesting because they have no hydrogen in their spectrum. Uh, and this is a you know, it's not an uncommon type of supernova. Uh, this one came from NGC 4666. It's a spiral galaxy about 50 million light years away. Using some archival data from the Hubble Space Telescope, the, a team led by Charles Kilpatrick at Northwestern University examined images of NGC 4666 taken about two years before the supernova explosion. And this is why archival data and, and surveys, this is one of the reasons that they're important, just to tie back to the conversation earlier. Uh, after using models to account for the dust that would be between us and the star that they think probably was the progenitor for this supernova, they determined that the star likely had a temperature of around 6,800 Kelvin and would be about 300 times the size of our sun, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And I mean that like literally, it's a, it's a low temperature for a star uh, that results in a type uh, 1b supernova because stars that don't have hydrogen in their outer layers are typically much, much hotter. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a couple possibilities for why this star didn't have any hydrogen before it went supernova. One possibility is that the star was shedding its outer layers of hydrogen in the years right before the supernova explosion. Another possibility is that the hydrogen was stripped away through gravitational interactions with another star. Follow-up data taken after the supernova was discovered shows that material ejected by the supernova explosion collided with a lot of hydrogen uh, after, after the supernova happened. And so that supports the shedding hypothesis, which is really interesting because we still don't know that much about what happens right before a massive star explodes as a supernova, but they need to do a lot more 
uh, digging a lot more follow up to see what actually is happening. Uh, and if the if they want to test the other hypothesis that it was a, another star that stripped away all of the hydrogen, they'll have to wait until the supernova dims down so that they can actually see if there's another star in the vicinity. Uh, people are familiar with the the type 1a. What was the dip? You know, the type 1a, of course, being the the star that's feeding off of a partner star of a white dwarf, and then it explodes. Do you, what's the type one B? Do we know why they're they both have the type one designation? Yeah, I'm a little confused by this naming as well because a type two supernova is one that forms from a collapsing star, um, but I I think that the these different types. It has to do with how the supernova happened and also what are the features that you see in the spectrum and how long does it take for the right. supernova to come down. Yeah. Um, it's all history. Like yeah. All these things were named decades and decades ago based on s optical spectra of, of these features. And they had no idea what made any of them. So there was a type 1 and a type 2 and a type 3. And then they started like combining and subdividing in, in classic astronomy style they never went back and actually sort of just fixed things <laughs> and so now we're stuck with these stupid designations that don't yeah. really make sense yeah right and grad students just have to memorize what these things mean right exactly i was just thinking that <laughs> yeah um very cool um all right morgan you want to talk ingenuity i don't really have anything like coherent to say about ingenuity just like oh my god oh my god oh my god that's that's uh, been the last like three or four weeks of yeah of this show so but but feel free so, to continue I mean, the continue the, the party yeah i mean it, i think the big news in sort of the last week or two and it's hard to kind of keep track of the order in which some of these things has happened is that they've extended ingenuity's mission to indefinite uh, and I think we all kn knew this was going to be the thing. There's, there's this would have been interesting to get Tanya's sort of impression on this because my experience is that there's like a real culture of just this sort of you don't talk about the thing before it happens at NASA. And so they might have had two years of plans for ingenuity, but because the mission was do these five test flights, it was as if that was the only thing that was ever going to happen, you know, by the grace of God. And uh, and now that it did those five test flights and it isn't a smoldering wreck, it's like, oh my gosh, look, we have, all, look at all these other ideas that we just came up with off the top of our head in the last 30 seconds, uh, you know? And so, to, but you never really know. And so to see that actually come out is great because you don't wanna leave functioning hardware behind on, a, on another planet. So the- and, I mean, the yeah, latest yeah. big accomplishment was they did a a full one flight. Way. Yeah, one way flight. Right, and that's kind of like the first step in this new world of exploring. Is it's not just flying back and forth, and then flying back and forth a little higher, and then flying back and forth a little faster. It's actually going somewhere new and doing something different. Mm -hmm. And I just can't get enough of the pictures that it's taking from while flying and the pictures are so much better than the pictures like 10 years ago from things that were sitting still yeah uh it's just it's bonkers and and to have that now sort of following along uh perseverance like a, a puppy on your heels or something is is just amazing and so I, yeah like i said i don't have anything coherent to say other than stuff is working and better <laughs> than we thought well, I'm sure we can dig a, a little deeper into this. Uh, so with the with the latest flight that they went to a totally new location. Now, was this because because like on the third flight, they did like a really long flight and then came back to the same landing pad. But this time they landed a new spot. So had they sort of scouted out the the, the landing, the potential new landing site. And then with the fourth flight, they actually put down at the new location. Yeah, so that kind of is illustrating the sort of key task that they're going to have to repeat a bunch of times now. So prior to the initial flights, they used Perseverance's cameras to basically map the surrounding area really well to make sure that they were going to fly to and from places that were safe. But your scout helicopter is not that useful if you have to scout for your scout helicopter. 
Right. And, and so they demonstrated basically the ability to identify a safe landing spot based on footage captured by the, um, by the helicopter on a previous flight. And so basically you can imagine this cadence that they might kind of enter into, which is to do a, uh, a return flight from their location, scout out in a direction for a minute, turn around, fly back, land where they know it's safe, then spend some time on earth analyzing where to go, both for interesting scientific value, but also for navigational purposes. Then they do a one-way hop to that new place and then they repeat. They do another two-way flight to scout out the area, maybe multiple times, two or three times, find the right path and then go forward. And you basically have to do it that way because how, of how autonomous it has to operate and how short the flights are. You know, 90 seconds is kind of the baseline and they push that a little bit, uh, but two minutes is probably sort of realistically what, what you're looking at. And so you don't want to take off not knowing where you're going to land when you're going to come down in two minutes, no matter what happens. <laughs> right. Yeah, probably a nearby tree. I, I, well, I that would a be a discovery worth making. Well, I know. I found a cartoon. That's the way they're going to they're going to discover life on Mars is they're going to crash the, uh, the 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 helicopter into a tree and then they'll they'll find a tree. Um, so then, I mean, the impression that I had got and, you know, of course, they've been sort of make preparing our, us for disappointment, they had said, okay, we'll get a couple of flights and that's it. But, but now like it's smooth sailing as it were for kind of you, like for no end in sight yeah. at this point. Right. What I'm, so the things we don't know are how well the solar panels will continue to charge the battery. You know, that was the big question with spirit and opportunity. And it turned out not a problem. Uh, one might imagine it's not going to be a big problem here because every flight is sort of a self-cleaning process in a way. Um, we don't know how the dust is affecting the mechanics of the the rotors and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so there could be over time, you could get some grind in, in there. And then I think the other thing we don't know is sort of how conservative they're going to be with, with what it can do. Because evidence suggests that they could do what I said before, basically just hop and hop and hop kind of indefinitely. But you could also imagine there being more interesting things that you could do. Like, I'm really interested to see if they keep trying to fly higher. So this this last flight was 10 meters, which is good. 10 meters is better than zero meters. But imagine if it flew to 100 meters, and then you would really start getting the yeah. benefits of long distance planning. Uh, and if it flew 100 meters in the air and kind of drifted sideways a little bit, you could get these big stereoscopic uh, regions looking forward, but we don't really know what the wind is like at a hundred meters, you mm -hmm. know, here on earth, the wind speeds pick up quite a lot as you go up in altitude. And so are they willing to risk that? And if they are, we might discover something about the gradient of wind speeds as you go up, but that would be the kind of thing that normally you wouldn't imagine NASA was going to be willing to try. But the whole kind of idea of ingenuity is that it's low risk because it was an add on to the to the big thing. Yeah, I'm uh, I mean, it's sort of like the mind is kind of my mind is running like a thousand miles an hour when I think about the, the potential for this, that it, that any future mission can be equipped with some version of this. <laughs> deploy a couple of them and then they just get to work autonomously mapping the terrain around the rover getting close flying high doing an overview but then also just looking at every single spot bit by bit by bit well in advance of the time that the i'll the, go ahead and predict that there won't be another mars rover without a helicopter yeah, yeah. uh whether they do a lander without a helicopter i think it could go either way, but I, I will lay a stake down and say there won't be another mission without a helicopter until there's like a plane or or something more helicoptery. Yeah, yeah, or a balloon. Um, but yeah, no, it's it, it really is game changing in the kind of science that they can do with those kinds of eyes. I'm sure the geologists are just so excited to have this kind of potential. Uh, for what they do. So exciting. Yeah, no, I know. I, I, I'm i perfectly fine just like in advance, everybody like if you just put ingenuity on the list of stories that we'll talk about this week, totally fine. Just week after week after week. 
you know. I want them to release more pictures. And maybe they are, and I'm just not finding them. But, you know, from the rover, there's like a raw stream of all the frames that are coming back. And as best I can tell, they're, they're not doing that with the helicopter. And I don't know if there's a reason for that, but I just want to make animations and see these. There ha still hasn't been a, a video of it, like looking down and flying around, right? And yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's I I, that's something that. that I have been looking for too. I've been looking for like you know whenever there's things that take a lot of pictures, people put together really cool time lapses. And there was a new image and a new time lapse that was released from NASA of the helicopter. In fact, they did it in three D with the with the stereoscopic vision of the of the rover showing the the helicopter flying past. But I haven't seen those those time lapses that people have done stitching together the entire flight seen from the from various perspectives so yeah I, it's it's kind of weird hmm. because nasa is usually w really on top of these things and yet every ingenuity video has been like two-thirds the engineers cheering in the control room uh and that's just very sort of un nasa to not sort of jump yeah. right to the the shiniest prettiest animation i mean the problem I'm you know i'm wondering if they aren't storing them on the spacecraft and just haven't retrieved them yet i mean on the lander yeah, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, I don't see like I'm doing a search and maybe someone in the chat can can figure this out. You know, there's 181. There's already 66,000 uh, images yeah, that have been I even released went to Kevin from Perseverance Gill's Twitter account because I figured if it existed, he would have it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't there. And then that's when I decided that they just weren't releasing them. Yeah, I don't think they're producing a raw feed in the same way that they're producing the raw feed for everything else that they do. What are you trying to hide, NASA? Hmm. Hmm. Why aren't you releasing more, the... du more dust devils? There's more of them than you think. Did you they see? Did you one. see the picture of the helicopter yeah. and the dust devil at the same time? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. All right. Activity on Mars. Yeah. So cool. All right. Um, uh, Morgan, uh, let's talk about your other story. Yeah, so let's talk about some actual Mars science here. Uh, and like Tanya was saying, a lot, sort of a surprising amount of what we know about Mars comes from orbit. Uh, you know, the rovers, the landers get sort of all the glory, but, you know, MRO is still plugging away, you know, 16 years later uh, at taking taking pictures and, and other, other measurements. And this was a really neat piece out of the Planetary Science Institute that used MRO data to identify potentially signals of very, very recent volcanism on, on Mars. Uh, so we know that the bulk of Mars's volcanism took place between three and four billion years ago uh, when the planet was a lot warmer and a lot more active. And we have quite good evidence that there was volcanism happening on the surface within the last few million years. Um, but these indications would be suggesting that we're looking at volcanism that maybe happened like tens of thousands of years ago, which is like basically right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was a result from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter looking at an area in Elysium Planitia, which is one of the more volcanically active areas on Mars. And they combined both high-rise images with some of the more, some of the spectral mappers to identify this sort of dark region that was circular around a depression, which looks kind of like lava coming out of uh, a volcano. And then they matched as best as we can do from orbit, the chemical composition of that material to the sorts of things we see in lavas on other solar system objects like Mercury and, uh, and the moon. And so all these bits of circumstantial evidence kind of line up. And then there's this kicker, which is that InSight, um, which is about 1,600 kilometers away, has recently detected two Mars quakes that were localized to this same area. And the interpretation that they've had is that this is possible uh, magmatic uh, motion underneath the surface. Yeah, I saw the I saw that story that that InSight had detected like it detected like 600 quakes over the last year 300 600 anyway the maximum was like 3.3 magnitude so not big but it was able to detect one that was almost 2000 kilometers away so it's actually got a pretty big range of mars that it's listening to and hearing these 
hearing these quakes and definitely to have that level of quake shows you that there is it's not completely solid as a, as a rock yet. Yeah, so a lot of what we see on the Martian surface is volcanism that looks like it was sort of oozing out of the surface, very sort of low pressure uh, emission of, of lava. But this particular thing is interesting because it looks much more explosive based hmm. on the sort of distance and mass that, that it they compute that it would have had and they suggest that it would have thrown debris as high as 10 kilometers into the atmosphere so this is a real proper sort of blaster of a of a volcano and for that to have happened like tens of thousands of years ago like if that happened today we would catch it some it would be noticed because you'd have that uh those uh, ash and stuff going into the atmosphere and one of the the wide angle mappers from orbit would notice that mm -hmm. and people would start looking for the source of all of this new uh methane or, or whatever people would get freaked out by it and it wouldn't take that long for it to be found and that is kind of tantalizing because forty thousand years ago is not that long ago one of these things could pop off any time now um maybe but mm -hmm. we just don't know it's uh there's not a lot of heat left in the upper regions of mars and so this magma probably came from pretty deep and every, you know everything on mars has to somehow be tied tied into life and so their arbitrary connection here basically is the idea that a lot of explosive magmas come because magma uh, comes into contact with water uh, and the water lubricates the magma but also you know pour water on something really hot and you get steam and explosion basically and that's what drives the explosive nature and so the idea that there could be lava which is a great source of heat or magma with, which is a great source of heat in the same area as water brings together two of the key ingredients of of life and, and volcanoes are just wonderful places for uh, bacteria to live because you have all of this heat but also all these mm -hmm. uh these chemicals that create these energy gradients that are the foundation for for sort of microscopic life. Um, Andrew Planet is making a really good note in the chat that geothermal energy on Mars on the surface would be so rich for human habitats. Like if there was a place that had heating underneath, that would be invaluable because there's it's going to be so tough for us to get any power on Mars at all. Um, very cool. All right. So speaking of Mars, I just want to bring up one thing, um, which is that, of course, the we're, we're all talking about perseverance, but the the Chinese Tianwen rover is or, or sorry, the orbiter is still orbiting Mars. And they're the word is that they're planning to deploy the lander rover at some point in probably the next couple of weeks. So probably mid mid May when I mean, we're already mid May, but that's the plan. They're going to de deploy this. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm exciting. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm getting the pronunciation right. Jurong. Um, and so we don't know the exact date, but, and, you know, I mentioned on Twitter that the great galactic ghoul is is watching hungrily for for fresh uh, for fresh meat at this have point. Have they picked a location? Um, or have they told people that they've picked a location? Yeah, I don't know what the what the landing location is. Yeah, I've actually been looking for that, and I haven't seen any. They haven't really. So secret. They go. Where they think Utopia go. Planitia, yeah. somewhere in Utopia. Oh, they. Planitia. Oh, they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they haven't narrowed it down to specific spot. No, no. And so one of the things that's really interesting about the about the the Chinese rover, and this is a similar thing that they had with the with the the lunar lander and and rover that they did was they had a ground penetrating radar on board the their their lunar lander, the one at the South Pole, the Chang'e four. Um, and what was great was that they were then able to look down dozens of meters into the regolith and actually map out the shape and structure of the regolith down pretty much to where the regolith and it'll just turn into big chunks of rock from fine powdery sand to pebbles to rocks to boulders to bedrock. And and so the hope is that that they're going to have the same kind of equipment on this, which has never been deployed to the surface of Mars before. And so with it tested out on the moon, we should get this sense of how deep the regolith on Mars goes under the under the landing site and just get a sense of, you know, is it is it too deep to see in terms of just blowing dusty sand? Or is it 
you know, fairly close to the bedrock with, with sand drifting into, into pockets and things like that. So it's, so it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, I, I really, I hope for the best to see another lander and rover on the surface of Mars is going to be really exciting. And I look forward to all of the data coming back from that as well. Um, all right, well, we've reached the end of our, of our time. Uh, Carolyn, again, you're on my screen. So tell us what you're working on and where people can find out more. Well, I'm uh, actually still following Mars like Morgan is. And I last in the last week or so kind of fell down a rabbit hole following a story about uranium and uh, inside massive white dwarfs. So I'm still kind of tracking the papers down on that. Uh, you can find me at thespacewriter.com and online. I'm uh, on Twitter. I'm at, at, at spacewriter. Dr. McTeer. Hi, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Go Astro Mo. And lately I've been working on my podcast, Exolore. Season two is out. Uh, episodes are coming out. They come out every other Thursday. So um, check that out wherever you get your podcast. It's E-X-O-L-O-R-E. -O -O -E. Awesome. And uh, Morgan. Yeah, I've been doing a bunch of writing lately for the AGU's EOS magazine. So you can check out uh, that either in print or online. And my website is morganrenberg.com. I wonder who helped you get that gig. Yeah, I had a pretty good inside tip. <laughs> um, cool. So I've been doing, uh, again, a ton more inter interviews on my channel. Uh, a couple of, of big ones this week, uh, which I think you'll really enjoy. Uh, Michael Hecht is the principal investigator of the MOXIE experiment on on Perseverance. And so we talked for about an hour about about making oxygen on Mars and what the future holds for that, which was really cool. Great interview. So uh, if you want to learn more about about this weird little box making oxygen on the Perseverance rover, you should definitely check it out. We go deep, deep into the weeds on this one. So universe today on all the things and definitely check out my channel if you want to learn more. All right, I can put you guys all back on the screen. There we all are. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week here on the Weekly Space Hangout. We really appreciate it. Thanks for our special guest. Thank you to all of the moderators and our, and of course, 100%. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, for uh, keeping us all uh, <laughs> wrangled. At some point, we're going to convince Nancy to stick around uh, right into the show, and then she'll just never leave. But, but still, we could not do the show without you, Nancy. We really appreciate all of your help. All right. We'll see all of you uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Everyone waving. All right. Well, I'm pretty sure I've.